Well, welcome everyone to the Box Butte Watershed kickoff meeting. Uh, my name is Stefan Chappé. I'm with the Department of Natural Resources. Uh, let's just go over a few rules of the road um, before we really get into everything here. We will have everyone muted during the presentation um, just to help eliminate any background noise. So if you have questions during the presentation, we encourage you to use the chat box um, and we'll stop at various points such as at um, some of our poll questions just to answer those questions. Um, also, if you have a video, we encourage you to share that. Uh, it's nice to see the people that we're working with on this project. Uh, if you're on your phone or you have any technical difficulties, please contact Mackenzie Merritt. Uh, we have her email listed there, mackenzie.merritt at nebraska.gov. Uh, on Zoom, you can also send her a private chat as well. Um, and she also has a copy of the presentation. If you email her, if you're ever having trouble viewing it for any reason, she can send that to you so you can have a copy. Uh, we are recording this webinar as well. Um, so if you know anyone that was not able to attend today or if you're leaving early, uh, we'll have it posted on our YouTube channel and we can get that link to you uh, if you just send us a message after this meeting. Uh, for those of you that haven't used Zoom, does, Zoom as much, um, here's just an overview of some of the features that are available. Uh, there's mute and unmute functions. So when we get to those poll questions, you can unmute yourself to ask the question or you can put it in the chat. Um, there's start video next to that. It looks like everyone's familiar with the chat feature. And then there's reactions as well if you wanna give a thumbs up or a wave or anything else like that. Uh, like I mentioned, we'll have four poll questions during the meeting today. They are anonymous, but we'll use them afterwards for any follow-up that's needed. Okay, like I said, I'm Stefan Chappé. I'm an engineer with the Nebraska Department of Natural Resources. I'm also the project manager for the Box Butte um, County project. Uh, I've been with the department for just over six years now, uh, and I'll pass it off to Adele, another member on our team, and she'll introduce herself and a couple other members on our team. Hello, my name is Adele Phillips and I'm the flood mitigation planner with Department of Natural Resources. I've been here a little over a year now. Um, I'll be presenting a little bit later in this in this hour. Um, I'd like to also introduce Michelle York, who is our administrative assistant. Many of you have already interacted with her just in the setting up of this meeting. She helps things run smoothly at our office. And we've also got Mackenzie Merritt online, who is going to be providing technical assistance. She's an outreach, outreach specialist with us. And so if you have any issues, don't hesitate to email or send her a chat through the chat window in Zoom. Thank you. Okay, and then lastly, I just wanna hear um, from everyone else in the meeting as to who's here. Um, and if you're listening as part of a group, um, if you could just put everyone information in the chat, just name and position and maybe the community you're representing um, so that we can get everyone listed as part of our sign-in sheet. Um, but first, do we have anyone from Box Butte County here representing the county? Um, you can either take yourself off mute or put it in the chat, just your name and position. This is Barb with Box Butte County, uh, the road department. Thank you, Barb. Anyone else with Box Butte County? This is Nan Gould. I'm the Region 23 Emergency Manager that includes Box Butte County. Thank you, Nan. Anyone else with Box Butte County? All right, do we have anyone with the City of Alliance here today? I'm Brent Kusick. I'm the Community Development Director for the City of Alliance. I believe I'm the only one on here from the city. All right. Thanks, Brent. And do we have anyone with the Village of Hemingford here today? Give it just a few moments, see if anyone pops up in the chat. Okay, and do we have anyone from FEMA? I think I saw Lori at least sign on, if you wanna just say hi. 
Hi, good morning, everyone. Laurie Bestian. I'm um, with FEMA Region 7 out of the regional office in Kansas City. I'm a program manager for the risk map uh, program, and I primarily support the state of Nebraska. Hi, um, this is Emily Hatcher. I'm also on for FEMA Region 7. I'm the floodplain management specialist for Nebraska. Thank you. And I'm John Cook with Nebraska Emergency Management. I've got the Box Butte Region 23 planning areas, one of my responsibilities. If Hi, I'm Diana Mendoza Colley, and I'm with FEMA Region 7, and Nebraska is going to be one of my responsibilities. Uh, please be patient with me. I've just been here a month. Nice to meet everyone. And that's a good point as well. This is one of our first virtual meetings, so hang with us. Hopefully everything goes smoothly. Uh, there might be a few bumps along the road. Uh, but if there's anyone else that wants to introduce, introduce themselves, I'll wait just a, another minute or two here. Um, feel free to share. All right, well, we'll go ahead and get started here. Um, so first thing I wanna tackle is just why are we all meeting here together? Uh, we're really not just making maps for the fun of it, but flooding poses a real risk to our communities. Um, and that was never more clear than in 2019 for Nebraska. Um, so that's really why we're meeting here today is discuss this project and reduce um, that risk. So the big overarching goal, goal of this entire project is just to make your community more resilient to flood risk. And it's hard to know how to be resilient when you don't know where that risk is. So um, this project is really oriented and um, towards identifying where that risk exists. Uh, so we do that um, by a number of ways. First, by using updated and modern engineering methods to update the maps. Um, those maps will be used to update the flood insurance rate maps to convey that information. And then that information in turn will be used by you um, to identify any actions that are needed to reduce flood risk. And by you, I mean um, the communities within Box Butte County. Okay, so that's sort of big picture why we're here, um, what this project is about. Um, some of the talking points we'll go over today is why, why are we here? Why do we need to update these flood maps? And then we'll dive a little bit into that process of how the maps actually get developed. Um, and then I'll speak a little bit um, to how your input as the community informs the maps and how they're made. And then I'll pass it over to Adele um, and she'll talk a little bit about why it's important and why reducing your flood risk has value. And then I'll wrap it up with just a quick timeline of what we expect um, of this project as well as some next steps for the communities as well as um, the Department of Natural Resources. Okay, so why do we need to update your flood maps? There's already flood maps that exist for Box Butte County. So we're just gonna do a quick knowledge poll to see if anyone knows when those maps were last updated. And now would be a good time if anyone has questions, you can put them in the chat or take yourself off mute. We're happy to answer any right now. Give you just a minute or so to answer. All right, looks like everyone's answered. So um, actually there are two correct answers. So if you put Jimmy Carter or Ronald Reagan, you would have been correct. Um, there's two dates. So Box Butte County was actually updated last in 1977, whereas the city of Alliance was about 10 years later in 1987, which would have been um, under Reagan's presidency. Um, so as you can see, the maps are pretty outdated. We wanna update them with current and modern engineering methods. Um, another thing to point out is the maps that are that currently exists for Box Butte County were done on paper. 
Um, so they're difficult to read. You can see the difference here between a paper map and a digital map. A lot of the information that went into these paper maps um, isn't really known. It's sort of a black box of information. We don't have any supporting data behind the boundaries. We just have the boundaries themselves. So by producing new maps, we'll have all of that engineering. We'll know the data that went into it and it'll be reproducible and easy to read. Uh, the new maps will also inform where flood insurance will be required. So any structure that does have a federally backed mortgage will be required to have flood insurance. Um, that's the same standard that it is now. The boundaries will just be um, updated. And it will also provide a basis for updating the community's floodplain ordinance, which is really your community's basis for reducing flood risk. Okay, so that touched on really the why we're doing this. Essentially, the maps are outdated using old engineering data. Um, they're difficult to use and not super useful um, in the state they're in right now. So we really wanna update those and I'll talk about how we're going to do that moving forward. So we'll have another poll question here. Again, if there's any questions yet, feel free to take yourself off mute or put it in the chat. Okay, so looks like almost everyone got it right. Um, these are just various terms for using a floodplain or um, specifics of a floodplain, but they're all different terms um, that represent a floodplain. Uh, the 1% annual chance flood, you'll often hear that referred to as the base flood or the 100 year flood, um, just another way of wording that. Okay. So this is sort of big picture view of how the maps are developed. Um, with DNR, we start with a base map and this is really anything that's non-engineering related. So it'd be your aerial photography, your road names, your corporate boundaries, um, anything like that. And we rely on communities to get a lot of that information as well. And we'll talk about that um, towards the end of the presentation. Um, and then with that, we use topography. And this is another big reason why these maps need to be updated. Um, as of 2017, we have LIDAR for the entire county of Box Butte, um, and that um, is at a resolution of about one meter to one meter scale, whereas the old paper maps that were done, especially the 70s and 80s, would have been 30 meter by 30 meter grid cells or even larger than that. Um, and then that topography data um, will pair with um, the engineering side of things. I really lumped everything into the floodplain boundary, but that's really the um, the hydrology and the hydraulics that we'll talk about in a second that are used to produce that final boundary. And then that boundary is overlaid on top of that base map that we created at the beginning um, to create an easy to use map. And in the end, the map will be published on our site, on FEMA site, um, easy to access from any computer. Uh, so I talked about this a little bit, the base map, anything that's non-engineering related uh, we'll actually be reaching out to the communities um, with the current corporate boundaries and limits that we have to see if you have any updates that we're missing. Um, so we'll work with you to make sure that the corporate boundaries are up to date when these new maps come out. Okay, so we're doing basic study for the entire county. Um, the main difference between a basic study versus an enhanced study is that structures are actually not included in a basic study. Otherwise, the process is pretty similar between the two. There's not a big difference anymore um, with the tools that we have available to us. 
And hopefully this figure on the right looks familiar to you. It was included in the engineering models letter um, that hopefully you received um, a couple weeks ago. We will be doing a study for anything that drains greater than one square mile. And that's what those lines on that figure are outlining. Um, so anywhere you see a line on that map is where we're gonna be having um, new floodplains. And then really all I want you to know as far as the color difference, there's a light blue line on there and a dark blue line. Um, anywhere we have that darker blue line is what we would consider more of our typical riverine flooding. Um, and that just depicts what method we're going to use as far as the engineering side of things. And then those lighter blue lines would be more of that sand hills terrain um, and topography. And depending on what we have, um, we'll use a different method. And this is just a brief overview of some of the engineering behind it. That letter outlines it in more detail um, if you received that. Um, but how we do this study is essentially in two parts as far as the engineering. Um, the hydrology, which is really how much water the stream will discharge for a certain flood event. So we'll assess different water or stream gauges throughout the county that track local flooding. And we'll calculate what the flow would be for the 10%, 4%, 2%, 1%, and 0.2% chance flood, or more commonly known as the 10, 25, 50, 100, and 500 year event. And then the next phase would be the hydraulics portion, and that's really determining how that much water, how high it gets. Um, and we'll actually have elevations for all of the events listed above for the hydrology that I just mentioned, but we will only produce boundaries for the 100 and 500 year um, events. So that's that 1% and that 0.2%. I believe the current paper maps only display that 100-year um, base flood event. So this will be an added data of showing that 500-year boundary. Along with just the boundaries themselves, we'll also produce um, items known as flood risk data tools. These are not regulatory items. They are used um, to help with any mitigation efforts. They're for the communities so that you can have a better understanding uh, of the actual risk at maybe even a property level. So um, the first, we'll make three different items. The first would be flood depth grids. So aside from just having a physical boundary, you'll be able to go on our map and click around and see what the depths are in different locations within the floodplain um, for the 100 year or 500 year event. Uh, along with that, we'll have percent annual chance grids. Um, so again, you can click around within the 100 or 500 year floodplain um, and you can see, okay, what's the percent chance that I see flooding at my property in a given year? Um, it's not 1% for every property that's in the floodplain. Some people might be closer to the stream. Some might be um, on the outskirts of the floodplain. So that gives you a more in-depth view of what that risk actually is. And then on top of that, we also have the percent 30 year chance. So a typical mortgage lasts 30 years. So you might say, I only have a 1% chance any given year that I see flooding. Um, but if you have a 30 year mortgage um, and you're planning to be there that whole time, um, that risk increases and we can show there's a 26% chance or really a one in four chance um, that I would see flooding over the life of that mortgage. And these are just a few screenshots from projects that we've done before, um, pulling from our interactive map. You can see a little pin was dropped um, near a structure um, and you can click, okay, this is um, the 100 year depth grid. I can see at my property, if we saw this event, I could expect about half a foot of water. And then similarly at that same location, I can click and say, okay, what about any given year? What's the chance I see water at my property? And it would be a 4% chance for that specific property. Okay, another quick poll here. I just wanna see from the community is how many of you received um, the engineering methods modeling approach met letter um, that was sent out that I referenced earlier that had that figure. If you're not representing a community today, um, just select that bottom answer. Again, if anyone has any questions up until this point, um, feel free to take yourself off mute or put it in the chat.
Okay, it looks like we got kind of a mixed um, bag here. So we'll use this um, to reach out to the communities after the meeting um, and make sure that it was received. It would have been sent to the CEO and the floodplain administrators for the communities, I believe. Okay, so why are we giving you all of this information? Why are we asking you um, to approve the methods that we're using for this study? Uh, we really wanna make sure that it makes sense to you. Um, you may not be the engineer for the community, um, but maybe you have an engineer that you work with or there's one for the county that you can reach out to. Um, we encourage you to share it with them. If they have questions, they can contact me directly uh, and we can talk through it. Um, if there's other areas where you've seen flooding and you don't see that flooding source listed as far as the what we're actually doing for this project, uh, reach out to me. We can see if that's actually included or um, we can discuss what it would look like to add something. Um, but really we want you to understand where we're doing the study and how we're doing it um, before we move forward. All right, and then we also want your insight into the maps. You have um, the knowledge of your community more so than we do and you've experienced it, it there so we, um, have a few things that we would uh, would be helpful to us um, to gain that knowledge. So uh, if you have any areas where you've experienced flooding or repeated flooding, that would be helpful, helpful for us to know if you could reach out and just let us know that. Um, if you have any development planned, um, that would also be good for us to know with this project going on. Uh, if you've already taken any mitigation efforts or you have plans to reduce flooding such as culverts, drainage systems, um, or any areas that you know that need to address flooding. Um, if you just take a little bit of time over the next few weeks or months um, to think about that and get back to us um, just with any information that you have regarding that. And then along with just that sort of base knowledge, if you have any technical information, um, that would be helpful as well. Um, I already talked about the corporate boundaries and we'll be sending something out on that for you to verify. Um, but if you have topographic data, that would be newer than 2017, which is when the LIDAR was sourced for this county. That could be helpful. Um, we could use that to supplement what we already have. If you know of any ongoing studies, hydrologic or hydraulic, um, that would be useful. Uh, As-built information. Um, and then the big one would be any high water marks or historical storm data. That's um, data that we can tangibly use to calibrate any models that we have um, to ensure that um, what we have makes sense with what we've seen in the past. Okay, I'm going to give you a quick break from listening to me talk. Um, and this is just a video that FEMA made. It's a few minutes long, um, just from a community's perspective that's gone through a mapping project. Denver is a very active community. People come here because they love the open spaces. The best part of my job is getting to see the final product, like Confluence Park. This park provides an experience with nature for people who live in an urban setting. Rivers and streams add charm to a city, but they also bring a risk of flooding. I don't think people understand the potential flood threat associated with this area and the fact that a portion of this park is really done as a mitigation to that threat. Denver's Urban Drainage Flood Control District is constantly looking at flood risk data and working on ways to make the community safer. One way they do this is by using the latest data to update their local flood maps so the community understands its flood risk. When we are going through a floodplain mapping process, we reach out to the public and look for anecdotal evidence that they might have so that we have the best information in the maps that FEMA ends up using. As flood maps are developed, FEMA and the community work together to gather the most accurate data. Communities can provide input on areas of flooding concern early in the process, so they build the map together. We know our streams, we know our communities, and so we bring local knowledge to the mapping process. This also makes the process more efficient and cost-effective for everyone. Communities don't need to wait for FEMA. They can start an update at any time with a community-initiated map revision. It was about... 1996, we had a very heavy snowfall. 
the small creek, Mercer Creek, overflowed and filled our neighborhood, several blocks in each direction. The water was about three feet deep in front of my house. The flood 20 years ago came slowly enough that we were able to move out of harm's way. But when it happened this year, I woke up at six in the morning and I had 18 inches of water in the house. Because flooding is so common here, Kittitas County has a lot of new flood data. The community partnered with FEMA to update its flood maps. We are in a very active process now of updating those maps. We just finished 200 miles of remapping. That was through FEMA's mapping process. We're supplementing that with our high resolution digital maps. If you as a resident believe that this map is inaccurate and you have a high water mark on your barn, we can go out and survey it and we can use that elevation to decide whether or not our map's accurate. So that anecdotal information is extremely important. Updating a flood map is highly encouraged. Communities that take an active role as they go through the map update process help make their map as current and precise as possible. These maps really give us a better idea of what that extent of flooding is going to be when it happens to us. They empower people to make much better decisions about the most important investment in their lives, their homes. Want to learn more about collaborating on your community's flood map? Get more details at fema.gov slash mitigation. Okay, so part of that was talking about communities that started their own um, risk map project, but we're already um, here today talking about the project that's ongoing. So um, for the communities that are here, it's important that you get involved with this project so that you're not um, funding the bill for it when there is a new project that's needed. All right, so with that, I'll pass it over to Adele um, to talk about uh, the mitigation side of things. Thank you, Stefan. Hello again. Um, uh, my name is Adele Phillips and I am the flood mitigation planner with the Department of Natural Resources floodplain management section here to talk with you about mitigation. Um, behind me is Carhenge, uh, which I had the pleasure of visiting um, late this last summer. And I guess for those of you folks from Region 7 probably don't know that we have a Stonehenge in Nebraska built out of cars. It's a great little stop in one of the most beautiful parts of the state. So I highly recommend swinging by Carhenge in Alliance if you ever get out to Western Nebraska. Um, so uh, my background is as a land use planner um, at county and town government level. So I've been um, at the front desk talking with property owners about um, their development interests and, and how to work within regulations to meet their goals. Um, sometimes these properties that we care about are in inherently hazardous areas. Um, next slide, please, Stefan. And when they're in inherently hazardous areas, such as a floodplain, uh, we can implement mitigation measures to reduce the effects of that flooding. When we, when we reduce our risk of flooding, we get other benefits. Um, some of those benefits include a decreased cost of flood insurance. Um, we safeguard the lives of our, ourselves and our loved ones and our neighbors. We, we safeguard our property from damage. Um, it also in, can include or increase a Oh my gosh, so tongue tied. It, it can improve our quality of life in a community. This means, um, you know, mitigation can be creating open space that can have multi uses as parks and recreation. Um, they they create desirable places to live um, when you allow a floodplain to be um, in a natural state. And and also when we mitigate we improve our community's resilience. So resilience is our community's ability to bounce back. It's, our, it's also a community's ability to weather not just flood hazard, but other hazards as well. Um, resiliency is, is a redundancy of, of 
um, hazard response and prevention activities. So in the next slides, I will um, go through some general categories of mitigation measures. Um, the thing about mitigation measures is generally there's not a silver bullet. Mitigation is about selecting a, sec a, a spectrum of smart options that you can implement. So um, these are the approximate categories that um, FEMA has put in their floodplain um, management manual, and you can read more about them there. Um, so I've just borrowed from that categorization. Um, some examples of each of these. In prevention, this is where you can include your regulatory systems, your, your planning and zoning regulations, um, your floodplain management ordinance, those, those tools, those policies that help ensure development um, is done smartly and, and appropriately given the local conditions. Um, your, a community can implement stormwater management policies um, in stormwater management, the general goals are reducing the amount or limiting the amount of impervious surfaces and, and sequestering rainfall where it lands, um, you know, and having it sequestered on site so that it doesn't have to then go and be part of, of um, an event that might overwhelm your stormwater system. Um, Preserving open space and having open space policies is another thing that a community can do to ensure that a floodplain's natural functions are, are retained. Uh, with regard to public information, this means having maps available, uh, maps at your, your city or county offices, but also have resources in your local library. Um, understand that or help real estate agents understand that um, they need to convey uh, when a property is in a flood hazard area to a prospective purchaser, um, but also um, making the information widely available to prospective buyers of properties. Um, outreach projects can include an annual flyer that you put within uh, your utility mailer um, that just just discusses that flood risk exists, and these are the resources available into the community to the community. Here's where you go online to learn more, et cetera, et cetera. For property protection, this is where uh, maybe you've got a flood prone structure. There are resources available to either to purchase and either relocate or dis, um, destroy uh, that structure. Um, and so that it is no longer uh, prone to flooding, but also is not a hazard um, to others by its existence within the floodplain. You can also elevate structures. That means raising, um, raising them up such that the habitable spaces aren't being inundated by flood waters. Um, flood proofing is using materials that aren't subject to water damage and, and um, ensuring that electrical, uh, all the wiring is above the, uh, the range in which it could be affected by floodwaters. Sewer backflow prevention devices are another simple thing. You know, we have, we have gravity systems um, to handle our, our community sewer systems. Sometimes those uh, systems can get overwhelmed and start to back up. Well, uh, a sewer backflow prevention device just keeps that um, sewage from entering into somebody's home as a result of a system being overwhelmed. Natural resource protection is, a, is probably the most cost effective uh, space in which to um, protect against flood impacts. It means um, we don't fill our wetlands, um, neither do we grade or excavate them. We don't um, alter water courses, st straighten our water courses and take out the natural meanders. Um, we maintain our grass waterways. You know, in, in Nebraska, um, we're an agricultural state and um, we've seen that in all our little intermittent streams, they're getting further encroached and encroached upon um, with row crop agriculture and those natural margins along these um, intermittent water courses are, 
are being removed. And as a result, uh, soil erosion is washing down through those, those intermittent streams and, and causing um, detrimental effects in terms of flooding um, and, and greater scouring downstream. Um, erosion and settlement, sediment control, again, um, that can be like maintaining grass waterways, but it can also be ensuring that when you've got a development going on, that um, loose stockpiles of earth have straw wattle around them to present, prevent that, that loose soil from sloughing off into your, your drainage system and causing maintenance issues. With regards to emergency services, this means having Next slide, please. It might be a leg. Okay. This means having early warning systems, letting people know that um, the flood potential is there. Um, we've got anticipated weather systems that are like or, or conditions um, that are likely to cause flooding in your area. Um, knowing how to uh, inform people that either they need to prepare to evacuate or to evacuate. With regards to flood response, uh, that can include um, in your emergency response, knowing which roadways are prone to flooding and will likely be inaccessible and having those alternative routes understood. Critical facilities protection, I mean, making sure our healthcare facilities don't become islands that we can't access during a, a hazard. Um, and, but also making sure our emergency services facilities, our volunteer fire departments, et cetera, are not located in flood prone areas um, so that we can access them when we have um, hazard events. Um, the last category, structural project, is probably one that first comes to folks' minds when they think of mitigation, but this is also the most costly and, and um, uh, in terms of implementation, but also maintenance uh, approach here. Uh, but it can include things such as reservoirs or modifying channels and enlarging uh, bridge spans or the span between abutments and, and also increasing culvert size so that you can increase conveyance in a flood situation. So the whole point here is that there's a, a spectrum of options and knowing more about what the nature of the flooding is that occurs and, and what causes it um, will help you I, make smart choices about the appropriate mitigation measures. On the next slide and in, in the chat, it, Mackenzie is going to put a link to something called a story map. This is a combination of a narrative about the community of Beatrice with maps. And it's, it's a story of Beatrice, Nebraska's um, long-standing program of property acquisition. Now, this is not every community solution, but in Beatrice, this is something that they have found um, has really uh, reduced the community susceptibility to flooding, but also created a network of parks and open space that are available to the community now. My understanding of flooding um, in your area is that oftentimes basements can become inundated um, and and basements are important to us because we also experience tornadoes. And, and um, so when, when thinking about removing a basement or filling a basement so that we no longer have that flood issue and, and the mold and other associated problems, um, there are now resources available um, from FEMA that can help a property owner plan and, and figure out how to put in an above ground safe room so that you still have tornado shelter available. Um, this is some to a topic that we can provide you um, more information about um, as you explore what mitigation measures are appropriate for you as a community as a whole, but also on an individual property basis. Uh, next slide, please. So just, just to wrap up, um, Mitigation, uh, we can work with you to identify uh, partners and resources that can help you implement measures that are appropriate given what is known about flooding in your area. 
And in special cases, uh, we have the opportunity of providing something called real-time technical assistance. We have to get approval for these projects, but um, it's a. In some cases, we can identify um, a discrete area or, or, or a discrete mitigation measure, and we can we can test it out within our hydrologic modeling. Uh, maybe it's um, understanding better uh, constricted flow that's caused by a bridge or a culvert, something like that. We can um, get approval to do some analyses there and, and help a community identify what would be a good solution. So again, my name is Adele, and if you ever have any questions about mitigation, feel free to contact me. And I look forward to having conversations with you. All right, thank you, Adele. Um, I'll pause here just for a second. If there's any questions you wanna ask Adele, um, you can put it in the chat or take yourself off mute. Okay, we'll go ahead and move forward. Um, feel free to interrupt me too. You won't hurt my feelings. Um, so next, I just wanna go over sort of the timeline for this mapping project, as well as the next steps, um, both for the communities as well as um, us, um, the Nebraska Department of Natural Resources. So we're at the very beginning of this project. Um, we started receiving funds as of January of this year. So the only thing that's been done on this project is really setting up this meeting as well as sending out those um, engineering methods letters to the communities. Uh, the next phase in the project is really uh, the meat of the project, which is developing all of that data that goes behind the maps as well as the maps themselves and those flood risk products that I talked about, um, such as the depth grids and percent chance grids. And we would expect that to be about an year, a year and a half process uh, to complete all of that information. Um, that can vary depending on the complexity of the study. We know in the sand hills, sometimes that poses a little bit more of a challenge. Um, so we'll see how that goes. We're ex hoping a year and a half. Um, and if we see something again, like 2019, um, our department's focus shifts to flood fight instead of our mapping projects. So that could delay a project as well. Um, but we're shooting for summer fall. Um, to have our next big meeting like this um, to come together and that'll be our flood risk review meeting and that's the meeting where um, we really get hands on and you're able to see a lot of the products that we've developed um, look at certain areas provide us with comments um, we can go back and communicate with you uh, relook at certain areas and have that discussion at that point um, i won't go into too much depth on these next steps as we'll get into them at the flood risk review phase um, but there's a lot of regulatory periods in here. Um, there's a lot of opportunity for communities to provide comments, both to us and to FEMA, um, as well as a few other meetings uh, at milestone points along the project. Um, our goal would be to have these maps published um, by the end of 2024 would be the goal. Um, again, that's dependent on um, the particular project and um, anything else that can occur within that time period. Um, we're not going to keep you blind during this whole process for a year and a half, though, so we want to keep you guys all updated. So we do um, what we call quarterly reporting that will send out project updates to all of the communities, um, just stating what we've done the past quarter, what we're looking to do um, in the upcoming quarter. And typically what's the, what that's looked like in the past is just a PDF saying, this is what we did last quarter, this is what we're doing next quarter. Um, but we're starting to provide um, options for communities for different ways to receive that information based on their preference. So I'm gonna share real quick, just a story map. So this isn't officially published yet, but this is a story map that we're creating for Burke County, um, similar to the Beatrice story map, only it's tailored um, specifically um, towards project updates and information um, for that county specifically. So, it would look something like this. There would be an overview slide. This updates and milestones would be the tab that you would come to if you're just curious about, okay, what's been done recently on this project? Where are they at? Is that flood risk review meeting going to happen um, soon? Do I need to be ready for that? Um, we also have a tab for flood history that we can provide. 
um, depending on what we can find out about the county. Um, and then there's a lot of other information that would be related to this meeting we're having today. So project kickoff that would have um, information from today's meeting in there, um, creating flood risk data, just more information behind how the maps are actually, actually created as well as some of the regulatory steps, flood insurance, um, mitigation efforts um, that you can choose from as well. So if you would prefer to have your information just as an online resource like this that you can come to at any time, and you think this is something that your community would um, use on a regular basis, um, that's great. And we would encourage you to select that option when we pull up the poll. Um, but if it's something you don't think you would actually use and you think um, a PDF would be oops, more useful for you, um, then feel free to choose that option. So I'll have Mackenzie go ahead and launch the poll here. So email updates was that first way that we've typically done it before that I mentioned where we just send a PDF. The online resource would be like a story map option that I just showed. Uh, we also have the option to do it through social media. We can post if you prefer that, or we can actually give calls directly to communities to let them know where we're at. Again, if anyone has questions, feel free to take yourself off mute or throw it in the chat. All right, so it looks like the majority um, have selected email updates, but there's still a significant amount that said that online resources or phone calls could work. So uh, we'll talk in our office about what that looks like and see who answered what. Um, our priority would be tailoring it to the communities. Um, so we'll get back to you on that. Stefan, yeah. uh, this is John Cook with Nebraska Emergency Management. I think the key is um, like we here at Nebraska Emergency Management work very well with, with you guys. So having, knowing back and keeping uh, communication back and forth with us would be like email and phone calls. But I think one of the big things is like you were talking about earlier, you or Adele were talking about earlier, is getting this stuff out to the general public so that they are making very informed decisions when they're either buying or selling properties or you know, getting insurance or whatever, knowing their options, so that then they can cont contact either you or potentially here at Nebraska Emergency Management in case of, you know, are there, you know, especially the communities, you know, do they have options for grants and stuff like that? Then we can pass them back and forth between you and and us. So that again, they're making the most informed decisions. And also including you know, the Corps of Engineers, maybe not so with this particular uh, area, but still, you know, having that open communication is gonna be key so that people know, so that A, we're speaking with a single voice and B, that they're getting good advice as to what to do or not to do. Yes, absolutely. And um, we do send these updates to anyone that wants them. So if there's any, if we do just settle on email updates and as a community, you have individuals in your community that would like to know what's going on with this project, we can add anyone to that update list um, as well. Um, yes, that's a great point. Thank you, John. Okay, so just to wrap up, I'm gonna talk about um, some next steps for this project. So um, as the communities, the thing we expect next um, or most immediately would be any feedback on the engineering approach letter that we sent out. Um, I put a date of March 11th. I think that's even further out than the 30 days um, that was requested in that letter. But if you could provide anything by March 11th, um, and you can do that either by giving me an email or sending me an email, giving me a call, having your engineer or someone you're, that's more familiar with the data reach out to me directly. Um, that's probably the easiest way to do it. Um, and then we just ask you to stay engaged, read those project updates and understand where the project is at. And if you have any questions, don't hesitate to contact us. 
uh, you'll also be receiving um, that um, just the corporate boundaries that we have to make sure that they are up to date. So um, when you see that, we ask that you just respond to that so that we can get those updated for the new project. Okay, and then the next step, um, steps for us as the department um, are really to be here to answer any questions that you might have throughout the project, um, to review and provide feedback on any um, comments you have related to the engineering proposal that we have for the county, and to send those regular updates so that um, those quarterly updates and stay in constant communication with you. And then the meat of it is just to begin that data development phase and really get into the engineering of the project, start developing those maps and those flood risk products. Um, and then we're also here to help answer any questions or help you um, make the best decisions for your community when it comes to your flood risk and mitigating those efforts. Um, and then towards the tail end, we'll be preparing for our flood risk review meeting. So be looking forward to that. Um, again, tentatively for the summer or fall of 2022. All right, and then lastly, I've just posted um, contacts here that are helpful for you. I listed these before, but um, again, my name is Stefan Chappé. I'm a project engineer for DNR. Um, and then you heard from Adele a little bit earlier. She's our flood mitigation planner. Um, Michelle York, you've probably heard a lot from her already with setting up this meeting and getting reminders. Um, you'll hear from her again when we have our next meeting. Um, and if you have um, any general questions you can ask her. If she doesn't know, she can reach out to any one of us or direct you where that needs to go. Uh, another good contact with us is Jamie Ranke. She's our state CTP manager and she's on the call with us as well today. Um, and then I also listed a couple of FEMA contacts down there. I believe they're both on the call today too, if you want to get in contact with them directly. Um, and I'll just leave it on this slide here, but that wraps up the presentation. If anyone has any um, questions, um, feel free to ask them now. Take yourself off mute, um, put it in the chat, um, and we'll hang on here for a little bit longer. But if you don't have anything, um, you're free to go. We appreciate you attending. Um, we just ask that you would stay engaged throughout this project, and we'll continue to update you uh, as we make progress.